Hi everyone, welcome to another Clean Machine Live. I have a very special guest and a close friend uh, and who is also an ambassador with Clean Machine Pella Makers. Thank you for joining us again. I know you've, we've had some interesting conversations before, um, but I think this is going to be a very, very important conversation. One that, um, you know, that you and I both have dealt with in different ways, which is a, a healthy mindset and emotional state about the food that we are eating. We're in such a dynamic time where there's so much new information going on. And uh, this, this information can be a great thing. It can be an empowerment tool, but it also can get us into a fear state about worrying about all the different foods, the calories, my macros, uh, all of the things on the can't list, don't eat this, eat that, you know? And it can be to the point where we're stressing about our food choices so much, I believe this can actually do more damage than just having a treat food every once in a while itself. Mm -hmm. So I wanna try to, you know, as much as I am all about health, that means being healthy about the way you approach life too as well. And both uh, from a mindset and getting that into a, an empowered position where you're making choices that make you happy and enjoy life as well as make you healthy. Um, so thank you, Ella, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So let's let's dive right into this. I mean, you've got an amazing background with, uh, you know, your accolades of bodybuilding.com, you know, uh, trainer of the month, you're a shape magazine, a top 50 trainer, uh, you're a bikini champion, your, uh, yoga, your yoga poses are amazing. I that I've seen you, uh, in your pictures of Thai boxing, um, a certified professional trainer. And on top of that, a master's degree in social work. <laughs> it's a like bit of everything. A little bit of everything there, but you pulled it all together. Um, I know my mom was a, a social worker too, as well. She was a child psychologist, and but she before that was an artist. So she kind of combined her two passions and said, "Wait a minute, the children are are having a hard time, especially underserved children, are having a great communication barrier. You have these, you know, PhD educated people trying to talk to children, which is." FU is their, uh, you know, <laughs> every other word. So she said, well, wait a minute. Art is a universal language. Give them a piece of clay and they'll tell you their whole life story in that, if you can learn to understand that. So I think there's ways that we in this day and age need to learn to adapt to all this information, to be able to process it in a healthy way. And that's what makes me so excited to be talking about what you do as, a, as one of your main projects, which is the uh, Plant Empowered Coaching. Talk to us about why you started that and, and where it's gone from there. Yeah, well, it all goes back. It started with my own journey in fitness. Um, you know, I've been vegan since I was 15 years old back in 1995. Not as long as you, Jeff, but, uh, <laughs> but still a pretty long time. Uh, and when I got into fitness, um, I really put a lot of pressure on myself to use that as a form of activism. And if that makes sense, I was like, let me be the inspiration. So let me have this phenomenal body that everyone aspires to so that they will then ask me why or how I got that way. And I can tell them about being vegan and the benefits of a plant-based diet. Uh, because before that, I was into the direct activism and found that, uh, that that actually turned a lot of people off. It didn't get people in the door. So I said, okay, this is a great way to get people in the door. And I was passionate about fitness since I was five years old. So I got into... Um, the competition got really into uh, training, strength training, all different types of training. And and I started to develop um, basically a, a, some body dysmorphia. I would see fat that wasn't there. Uh, I was then getting very restrictive with my food, but not just for a competition. It was that I needed to be, you know, perfect all the time. So I was measuring and counting and my life revolved around food and what I was going to eat and how much and where and when, and what was I going to do if I had to, if I was going to go out to dinner. And then I started 
you know, having binge issues. And I would say, oh, I, I know I'm going to go to this restaurant. I'm going to want that bread. So I'm going to, you know, basically starve myself all day long so I can have some bread. And it just got very disordered. Um, but I was, you know, dealing with it with a lot of shame. So it was behind closed doors. I didn't share that with anybody. It was, it was embarrassing to me, but it was so all consuming. And it just really took a lot from me and from my life and from my ability to have the energy and joy I needed to um, really just become the best version of myself. And so I wondered why I couldn't connect with people as well. Even when I founded Sexy Fit Vegan, I, I felt like, oh, I wasn't really connecting. Well, I was trying to be perfect. And when it hit me that it was time to let all of that go and to just be me and to share my story and really um, put my energy into something more positive, uh, that's when I started my journey in, in self-improvement, you could say, or really talking about the programs in our brain and how we're programmed and how to start reprogramming that. Um, so that's that was the journey I went on. And when I was able to tell my story, when I was able to release that shame, when I was able to reprogram my mind and start to develop self-worth based on who I was as a person and not what my body looked like, you know, everything changed. I started, you know, being able to connect with other people, really help other people. And the cool thing was that I became healthier, both mentally and emotionally and physically. I got in better shape than I've ever been. At 41 years old now, I am the happiest by far I've ever been. I'm the healthiest from the inside out. And I'm the most fit I've ever been, all while not being too restrictive. I don't uh, count or track anymore. Not to say that there's anything wrong with counting and tracking. It's important to know. But I can tell you, <laughs> Jeff, you know, I'm sure you can too. I can basically <laughs> tell you what's on every nutrition label. Like, <laughs> yeah. I've ever seen in my life, right? You know, Probably. I don't 100%. So that's all in my head. So it's important to know, you know, be aware. And it's important to know the science and be educated. But it's also important to um, be able to eat intuitively as well and to be able to enjoy life and enjoy food yes. and not have that consume your life because you're missing out on a lot and the world is missing out on a lot of what you could possibly offer if that wasn't the case. Does that make sense? Uh, totally, totally. And and yeah, again, to reiterate, for, for those of you just getting into um, really getting connected to your food and stuff, yes, the tools of counting macros and stuff like can be very helpful because they'll bring you into an awareness of what that food is actually doing inside your body. But once you really develop that relationship and you understand, you can just see the food. And you know, okay, I know what that's going to do. That's going to cause inflammation. I know what that one's going to do. It's going to actually give me more energy. You know, you just start seeing food differently and how it's going to respond to you. Then you have to get your mind right because understanding that can also set you up to intentionally choosing the bad foods because you're not having a good day and you're punishing yourself and you're, you know, being uh, resistant to that. So you got to then start to get in touch with your own mental chatter, your own emotional roller coaster of a day and say, wait a minute, am I choosing this food because of stress, because of, you know, something going on in my life right now? Or am I really choosing it to nourish my body and, and keep me healthy? And actually we can use food as medicine. That's the way it would normally and health, healthfully should be used. But, um, but, so talk about that and and especially since you're involved in social work getting in touch with people getting in touch with yourself to to reconnect to a healthy play, emotional place can be the basis because i've talked to a lot of people about food and and for me my change in veganism was from the inside out so i changed my heart space then the rest of my choices just became automatic. It all became clear. I stopped doing drugs. I stopped drinking. I stopped smoking. I stopped eating all animals because I didn't want to hurt myself anymore. Mm -hmm. I wasn't punishing myself. I wasn't angry at myself or, or people around me. So when I cleared that, the rest of the things followed. But most people don't come to it by that. They actually, we have an opportunity to use food and exercise to actually uplift us, mm -hmm. empower us, and then go, hey, wait a minute, that feels a lot better than I was feeling 
what else can I do to make my life better? What else can I do? And that's more common a journey that people use exercise and proper nutrition to actually pull themselves out. But when you can tackle both of those at the same time, when you can address what's going on inside mentally and emotionally, at the same time as making conscious decisions about improving your diet and exercise, that can be very empowering. So talk about that because I know that's really kind of what's going on with you and and from your social work how do you do that with each person bringing their own individual let's say baggage uh and i don't like using that term because it's just a part of who we are attaching ourselves to it's it's not really baggage we can let it go at any time sometimes it's very hard because it's a strong emotional attachment but talk about that and and then how you designed your coaching to help people uh, get through that. Yeah, well, I, I want to go back to the programs that <laughs> we're all, you know, when we're, especially when we're very young, up until the age of seven, according to Dr. Bruce Lipton, um, that we're very susceptible. We kind of got this open mind and we absorb everything that everyone else is telling us to be true. And that includes <laughs> about our own selves. And what we absorb the most is all the negative uh, feedback that we get you know oh you failed that test what do we take that to mean when we're at that age in that brain space that we're a failure right, right? if we don't feel pretty we're not you know we're get made fun of we carry that it's insane we can be 40 50 60 years old and still carrying that and not knowing it because right. we think what we believe is true Correct. when it's not <laughs> Right. And we get to create that and we don't realize we have this power to create that. So there's a lot of uh, compassion that we're lacking for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Even us, uh, you know, people that have gone vegan for the ethical reasons. You know, we have so much compassion and it's the case for most people. We have so much compassion for everybody else and maybe mm -hmm. animals, but very little for ourselves. A lot mm -hmm. of the time we give ourselves the hardest time. And we don't even realize it. We don't even realize we're talking shit to ourselves, you know? And so when we start to recognize that and start to say, okay, what I need to do is start making choices from a place of love. And that's love for everyone else, but also love for myself. But that means we have to embody love for ourselves. And, you know, with people are like, oh, self love, <laughs> you know, it's annoying to talk about. But it's, you know what I mean? But it's true. It's true it that is. once. It's so important. Start, yeah, once we start really uh, taking care of ourselves and when we see that food, we're not saying that's that's not a treat that, you know, those chips or those cookies. We want to say it's a treat or give ourselves a reward, but that's not really a reward because what we're going to take a few minutes to eat it. It's going to taste good, but then we're going to feel like crap and, you know, it's not in line with our values. So really examining and, and taking a step back and say, what do I really care about in this world? And how can I align what I'm doing, my actions, food included, um, with what I really care about? And if we're not on the top of that um, care about list for ourselves, then that's something to take a look at too. So a lot of times we are making decisions, really setting ourselves up for a cycle of self-sabotage. We're you know, making split second decisions based on old programs and then we're restricting and then we're beating ourselves up and then we're saying oh now i gotta restrict again then i'm gonna binge and just this cycle and it's exhausting mm -hmm. um so what we really got to do is take a step back and start becoming the observer of our minds and our thoughts so that we can challenge the thoughts that we're having because our feelings are based on our thoughts and our actions are usually taken based on our feelings Yes. We're not going to necessarily change our feelings right away, but we do have the power to change our thoughts. And then we have the power to take action based on our thoughts until our feelings start to catch up. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. <laughs> but we can logically say, if we take a step back and we say, I'm going to examine why am I about to choose that cookie? Why am I about to do that? What's that going to do for me? Is that in line? You know? I want it. Maybe I have a sugar addiction. That craving is there. Maybe the physical addiction is there. Maybe the emotional addiction is there. But I can coach myself into a decision that's going to serve me better. Once you learn the self, we have a self coaching system that we teach our clients yes. that really takes you through this process in a very structured way. 
that if you do it consistently over time, you get to reprogram so that your new automatic is not going for the cookie. Your new automatic is going for the strawberries instead. But we will get in that habit. It won't be so, so much work. It's a lot of work at the beginning. Mm. But once you get it, then you can kind of change. It's, a, it's basically a habit change, but it's kind of mm. start here. Yeah, and, and that's that's kind of yoga in itself, right? Which is you keep uh, stretching, you keep consciously moving your body in a, a broader and broader range. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're at a place where you are in a much better place. Uh, so I think yoga teaches that, meditation can teach us that. Like uh, when I did uh, sweat lodges with the Native Americans uh, up on the reservation and Oh, it was amazing. And and I got such a powerful experience because you end the you go into the sweat lodge and then you just start pouring physically out of sweat. Mm -hmm. And then if you are in tune and in line with that, the emotions start pouring out and the thoughts start pouring out. It's because we are a whole being. Mm -hmm. And if you take any one aspect of our being and release it, the rest of the body tends to want to follow right along, right? <laughs> Just like you ever been a group of kids and one kid says, hey, let's go over there and run to that. And then everybody goes over there and runs it. Exactly the same thing because our emotions, our, our mental capacity, or even our spiritual self, our energetic self all wants to move together. And when you can trigger that flow. So I said, all right, well, this is a great experience. What do we do normally the most? Eat and move right <laughs> you've got to do both to survive <laughs> so plant-based nutrition and physical fitness it's just a perfect fit together so when i started getting involved in that more so uh, especially after i became vegan just the physical changes the health changes and you know i heard somebody post uh, recently that said um something to the extent that I never realized how good I could feel until I got here. I didn't even think this was possible. And that, that's an amazing experience. When you know real health, physical, mental, and emotional balance, there is just this buzzing harmony that happens. You don't get to experience any other way. And it's, it's such a powerful thing. It's hard to describe it to somebody who's never done that or been there they don't even think it's possible you know it's like when my wife first met me she goes you're too happy all the time <laughs> that's got to be fake right and i'm like no it's it's because i've done a series of different things did my emotional work did uh, and it's never over <laughs> until you're done right yeah. but did my my mental work too as well it's a constant practice but you can get to places where Yes, you are happy. Not all the time. <laughs> I still get frustrated, but um, but more so because I can see things differently now. I because I'm putting stuff in my body. It was amazing. A friend of mine who's a raw foodist naturopath and been raw food for a long time. Uh, somebody had poured a glass of uh, white wine vinegar uh, to use for a cleaning agent, and he thought it was water and picked it up, and it burned his throat. It literally scalded mm -hmm. his throat. It's because he had been living such a clean life for, you know, almost 20 years, that impurity caused his body to react in a very vital way. Now, I hear people say, oh, I'm sick. And I'm like, no, you're having symptoms of the sickness that you already had. Mm -hmm. The symptoms are not the sickness, the ill health that triggers those symptoms is symptoms are our body talking to us to say hey wait a minute you you've got something wrong somebody told me uh, taking an antihistamine so to stop your nose from running and stuff mm -hmm. is is like putting a, a pillow over the fire alarm when it's going off oh i don't like that annoying noise no that fire alarm's going off to tell you to get out of the building you know? <laughs> and that's our body communicating us to say hey wait there's something wrong chill out relax do something healthier let our, let us detox let us do the healing uh my post today was the greatest unkept secret is the body will heal itself mm -hmm. um when you give it the proper nutrients and 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 care um, there isn't a medicine required. It is a, an amazing self-healing machine. So I think that's part of the coaching, and I'm sure you do, is 
just get out of our own way for a while and let our body do its magic. <laughs> yes. And getting, you know, that starts with really getting back in tune with, with your body as yes. well, because mm -hmm. we're so disconnected from our bodies. And we have learned a lot of us from dieting, you know, not to listen to the hunger, that hunger is bad, you know, or that we don't even know a lot of our, my clients, are like i don't really know when i'm hungry or when i'm full like i those signals are are i've never listened to them right because we're so busy following someone else's diet so also getting getting to that place where you are able to to recognize what your body is, will need because it's so smart our bodies are so smart like what you were just saying it will tell you we're just not we don't know how to listen Right. So I think that's a big part of it is starting to really, and that, that involves having a lot of respect for your body. We sometimes mm -hmm. we make our bodies our enemy, you know, if it's not uh, feeling like we want it to feel or looking like it want it, we're wanting it to look, that's very stressful to have this brain mm -hmm. that's saying, I don't like what you're doing and create this dynamic that is, you know, that's dangerous really when it comes down to it. Totally. And I, I think there's a lot of good information coming out, uh, especially from the plant-based doctors. Um, it, it, it comes with a little bit of caution, though, because there is these back and forth about doctors who uh, are very bright and sometimes very educated people have a little bit larger egos than others. I know I've been guilty of that myself. But, um, but in, in wanting to be right and being passionate about that, sometimes they can get to a point where they're saying, don't do that. No, that's wrong. No, that's unhealthy. And it, it cr can create this food fear. You know, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that because of lectins. I can't do that because of, uh, you know, gluten. I can't do that because of uh, oil, uh, because of that, because of salt or this, because, you know, it's like, oh, don't eat nuts, don't eat. It's like, Jesus, you know, you, if you're listening to all this, you can get yourself into a really bad place of food fear. And I feel like that stressor can be even worse for you than, than the actual food itself. So, Talk about getting people to, I know you talked about the, using kind of biofeedback, which is finding the connection with the food and how it's going to affect you. And then choosing foods that more are in alignment with what it is you truly want. Not what you're in an emotional state in right now about, but what it is your real goals are. So maybe setting goals to begin with in the beginning and then realigning your body with food choices that said because we do that in any goal relationship right we have a goal of i want to travel to what okay well i have to work and save up money so i'm good about storing my money away so we make choices to get ourselves to that goal how do you help people make that connection about aligning those everyday choices so that we get into habits that help us reach those goals yeah, so I think you're so spot on with the doctors. There's information overload. People are <laughs> so confused. They're like, oh, I thought a whole food plant-based diet and I'm good, but oh no, I can't eat too many nuts and I can't have a drop of oil. And there's, you know, having that food fear is, is um, can set you up for self-sabotage, really. Um, but I think it's important first to kind of separate out where you are. If you've got a, a disease, if you've got diabetes, if you've yes. got, you know, you're at risk for a heart attack, like that's a different, that's a different scenario. Oh, so what totally. I think we're talking about is not people that right. are really trying to reverse or, or cure diseases, but kind of your everyday person who wants to be healthy, who's, you know, reach up, mm -hmm. trying to achieve their goals in fitness and, and health. So yeah, finding a balance that, that works for you is what I'm all about. So I talk about, you know, the ideal food, it's a continuum. There's ideal and then there's terrible. There's things that I will I will never have. Well, animal products is one of them, of course. Um, and that's, for me, that's an ethical choice. So that's not even, there's no cheating. Um, right. I am not gonna support animal cruelty, that's done. But when it comes to oil, for example, oils, there, there's really no, in my in my opinion there's no benefit to oil do i eat olive oil i do i love a spray of olive oil on my salads yes i can make uh oil free dressings no problem there's a million recipes they're great i still like a little olive oil on my on my salad so 
that's the choice I'm making now. That might change, but for now, that's the choice I'm making. Is it, is it perfect? Is it ideal? No. Um, but as a part of my balance of what works for me and keeps me healthy and keeps me feeling good, that's going to be part of my balance. And I'm going to be okay with that for now. I, I got rid of sugar, but I still drink alcohol, you know, not, not, not in excess, but I will have a beer on the weekends. Um, but I won't have sugar. I won't have refined sugar. Does that make sense? Maybe not. Right. But it's the balance that I've created for myself. And at this point I am healthy. I am fit. I am, uh, doing the things that I'm passionate about. I am not, uh, stressing over food. I'm not stressing about my choices. I can make, I can make, go and make right now, if I'm hungry and have 10 minutes, I'll go and put a, an entire bag of green peas in and boil them five minutes. Uh, put a spray of olive oil and some toasted walnuts, a little herb mer seasoning, which has salt in it. Um, and that's my, that's my lunch. Like 10 minutes, I have this big bowl of peas, you know, but <laughs> me, it tastes great. It's yeah. like a treat. It fills me up. Um, and I know if I'm going to work out two hours from now, I know exactly how many, because I can know what my body, how my body works. I know exactly what portion I need to have, not based on calories or macros, but based mm -hmm. on what I know is going to get me in a state in two hours that I can have my best workout, that I'm not yeah. going to feel full, but I'm also not going to be hungry. And mm -hmm. that takes practice. That takes experimentation. That takes giving you some grace, yourself some grace. That takes um, recognizing patterns also. Right. Um, you know, we can get a diet plan that says, okay, have a smoothie for breakfast. Great. That might not work for everybody, right? right. Maybe you uh, have a job that you don't get a break for four hours and your smoothie, you're starving after two hours <laughs> in the smoothie. So we either need to change the recipe of the smoothie or choose something different. What I found what works for me best for breakfast is actually a salad. And that took me years to figure out, but a, a, a salad with chickpeas and tomato and avocado um, and some greens, that will keep me satisfied until after lunch. Um, but I needed to learn that, you know, I needed to figure that out for myself. And so that's part of the process is really getting the education first. Like you've got to have a base knowledge, but then giving yourself some grace and giving yourself some room to experiment and figure out what, what, what works best for you. Cause you've got the 80, 10, 10 people saying you need 80% carbohydrates, right? 10% protein, 10% fat. That's great. That is healthy. That's awesome. doesn't work for everybody. Right. But those doctors often say that's the only way, right? right. So we need to realize that there's, there are different, and I, I kind of talk about, you're so big onto the, I love that you're so big into micronutrients because we all need, you know, these micronutrients. Mm -hmm. But what I do is play with the macro balances mm -hmm. as to what works best for each individual uh, client. That's awesome. You know, one of the, the coolest things that I learned in being vegan now that 36 years. Wow. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So um, one of the things that I learned is that a lot of foods, like when I do a smoothie, I'm empty within an hour, you know, yeah. uh, but most people are used to eating a heavy animal based meal uh, with processed foods that takes three hours for gastric emptying. So normally by three and a half to four hours, you're hungry again, which would be nutritionally correct. But the mind is already associated, oh, that's when the stomach gets empty. Now, when you eat foods that are really easy to digest and like fruit or smoothies or things and empty out in an hour, you feel that empty. You think, oh, I must be hungry again. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. Empty is not hungry, yes. <laughs> but we've created that association in our brain. You know, uh, I hear people, oh, when I eat Chinese food, because it's mostly vegetables, then I'm hungry again in, in an hour. And I'm like, no, you're empty the stomach, but you're not hungry. And you have to learn the difference between the feeling of being hungry and the feeling of being empty. Now, I love feeling empty. Most of my day is empty because I eat very highly digestible foods. Yeah. Um, so I love being empty. I feel light. I feel full of energy. If you've ever talked to someone who's done a fast for any length of time, the number one thing they'll tell you is, I have so much energy. Okay. And, and this is counterintuitive from people because most people think I have to eat to get energy. No, actually, 
eating, the act of eating takes about a third of your total body's energy to process. So when you stop eating, when you give yourself a, a rest, that's why we call it breaking fast, <laughs> break fast in the morning, yes. is because we are actually allowing our digestive tract to relax so that we can use that energy for healing and repairing while we're sleeping. Imagine if you can carry that healing and repairing on for a day or, or more, that is nutritional fasting. No, I'm not saying go out and starve yourself if you're <laughs> if you're hungry, eat. But if you're consciously trying to heal your body, fasting can be an amazing tool for that. Water fasting or even light juice fasting. Um, so talk about some other ways that you've found that are in in the transition. Because I know people talk about uh, some negative effects when they transfer to a very a diet from. Uh, so I'm. I'm going to be doing a, uh, a Facebook Live next week on um, on uh, oh, what's the anti one of the anti nutrients, and um, they are saying how that actually uh, blocks uh, the absorption of calcium. Uh, fight uh, not phytates. Uh, the other one, oxalates. Okay, so oxalates. Uh, oxalates are, are binding materials that bind to the calcium and, and prevents us from absorbing. So yes, we don't get as much calcium, but fortunately plants are loaded with it, so we'll get enough during, during the whole day. Here's the difference though. When you eat uh, plants with oxalates, then our body actually has a bacteria that will actually eat up that oxalate. They're oxalate-eating bacteria. Um, but if you keep eating more, you'll get more and more oxalate eating bacteria. Now, if you don't eat much greens and then you eat greens, well, you don't have that bacteria built up there. So you may experience some negative effects until your body adjusts to that, until those bacteria rise to the level of your intake of oxalates. But our body adapts very quickly. Fortunately, they've shown oxalate uh, increasing bacteria can do it as quick as one meal. So it can happen fairly quickly. But if you're making strong changes to your diet, you can get your body trying to release toxins, which can make you nauseous, which can make you headachy as it circles the brain, can make your joints ache because our body stores toxins in the joints. So you can actually feel it, it feels like arthritis. It's because when those toxins go out of the joint material, uh, collagen uh, is, doesn't have any blood vessels in it, so it's safe it, uh, away from healthy tissues and, and storing those toxins. So when the body says, okay, we're cleansing now because we're on a healthier diet, it'll pull those toxins out of our joint. And then of course our body says, whoa, toxins and sends inflammatory signals over there. And we feel inflammation in the joints. So it's like, I hear people say, oh, I went on a plant-based diet and I got terrible inflammation. I got nausea. I, you know, I got, felt headachy. I felt achy. I got a mild fever. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Your body's detoxifying all that crap. <laughs> and they're like, what? <laughs> So uh, how do you coach people in making these transitions and, and helping them to get through these uh, misinterpretations of what their body is telling them? Yeah, I, that's such a good point about people stopping eating meats and dairy and all those going through a detox process and but coming to me saying, um, no, this isn't working for me. I don't feel good. I don't have energy. Yes, we're doing detox. And I talk about a lot about listening to your body. Mm -hmm. However, <laughs> just because you have a craving for something probably means there's a physical addiction and toxification. So for example, think about a heroin addict, right? Heroin can, I don't think anybody's going to argue that heroin's not good for you, right? But when a heroin addict stops using heroin, what happens? They're going to feel sick. They're going to crave that drug and they're going to say, oh, I'm craving the drug. My body's telling me I need the drug, <laughs> right? It's the same. It's the exact same thing. Your body is not in a position at that point to let you know what it, need, what it needs. It's not telling you it needs that. It's saying I feel horrible because that was causing this body and my body to um, be full of toxins. And now I'm releasing it it's it's not it's not comfortable it's not pleasant but is it worth it a thousand percent so learning how to get control of your mind again because we have a feeling doesn't mean we have to act on that feeling because we have a craving doesn't mean we have to act on that craving we've got to get control of our mind our thoughts 
so we can walk ourselves through that process understanding what's going on number one so there's that awareness piece that education piece understanding it but then not giving into it is all about getting control of your thoughts and saying here's it's okay to not feel comfortable right now it's okay to not have a good day i mean same thing sometimes we overeat because we're trying to hide or run or distract ourselves from feeling bad from negative emotions when that's part of the human experience right and it's okay to sit in negativity sometimes and to, to let yourself have that without trying to cover it up or distract it with right. food or with drugs or alcohol or whatever it is that's your um you know drug of choice so all of those things play play a role in being able to get through that detox period um and come out the other side and really then starting to learn to appreciate and, and listen to your body at that point once you've detoxed from all those um substances so raymond uh one of our listeners has a quote uh, a question for you i just put it up on the screen for you ah uh hey raymond uh do i coach men i i do yes the program i have has been predominantly women and I was, i'll tell you why we talk a lot about our feelings <laughs> and there is um oh jennifer there is uh you know if i've we've coached men in the program got to be willing to talk because one of the things that is really important um when you're working towards emotional health is being able to be vulnerable like what i shared about hiding you know the shame i was in men men have the shame too um so it's really important to be able to to say okay i'm gonna be willing to share that and open up so as long as somebody is willing to kind of go all in 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 our program because we focus a lot on mindset and building a healthy relationship with with yourself in addition to food and and your body um so yes uh, men are absolutely welcome you just gotta be willing to open up <laughs> It's great. And, and take it from me that that is what actually caused my uh, choice to go vegan was an emotional breakthrough, was a therapist uh, that I was working with. It was a Native American healer, so non-traditional, but that's what it took for to crack me open. He just got me to pull up the emotional stuff and then just sit with it. And he would not let me off of it until it was so painful for me. I had to release it. And when I let it go, I felt all of the love that I had behind it. Because so much of what guys do is we get angry and then we bottle up that anger and store it. Because anger to us mean, can mean if it gets too much, it becomes violent. And guys, you know, obviously that can get us into big trouble. Um, so we don't go there. So we've been taught that anger needs to be suppressed or bottled up. Well, it doesn't go away. <laughs> it just sits there and comes out in other ways until we find a way, a healthy and proper way in a good environment and where we can trust to be vulnerable and release that and let that go. So that anger is not directed at anyone or anything, but can be released in a way. And the great thing about it is when I released all that anger I had for my father was an alcoholic. And of course, for me, he left at a pivotal time in my life when I was 18 and I was about to enter the world and the work world. I needed a guidance of a father. And he exited at 48, right at that time. And I was so angry at him for not being there, for not taking care of himself enough to be there for me, that my love wasn't important enough. My life wasn't important enough to him that he chose alcohol over me. I was furious yeah. but i was taking all that anger and it was eating me alive i was punishing myself with drugs and alcohol trying to suppress that anger and it wasn't until i got into that environment where that coach just let me let it all out and behind all that anger was sadness i was hurt because i lost him i wanted him to be there i wanted him to show him the things that i accomplished in life you know i wanted him to be proud of me I didn't get that experience and that hurt. And that's what it really came to. But behind that, once I let that through, I found a renewed love for my dad like I've never felt before. Mm 
I saw he was hurting. He was struggling with his own life. And he was so absorbed with that pain, he couldn't see what he was doing to me. Mm -hmm. And when I forgave him for that, I also forgave myself for all of the reckless things that I did when I was being angry at myself. So that's such a healing process. I encourage, especially males out there, because we're such in a society that is ingrained and trained in us that you have to stuff this emotion. And it's killing us. It's the reason why we have heart attacks and strokes at a much higher rate. Uh, it's the reason why we have obesity at a higher rate. We abuse ourselves because of this. And it doesn't have to be that way. You can enjoy life, feel good about yourself, but we do need to release this. And it all starts with the inside. It, you know, you can train yourself to eat right. You can train yourself to go to the gym, you know, set the alarm, do all those things. And you'll do them for a while. But eventually, that emotional state will take over. It will give you an excuse here, give you an excuse there. Say, a, you'll even injure yourself so I can't go to the gym. I've done that before. Mm -hmm. you know? It's like, oh, I stubbed my toe. I can't do leg day today. Come on. <laughs> you know, don't go there. I know what we're doing. It's, it's, it's psychological, but it's tied to our emotional selves. And just getting real with that emotional self can set a cascade to set you up to be making better choices for your life and for the people who love and care about you too. Because when you're hurting yourself, you're hurting the people around you. I think that's really important. Jeff, I have to break in there. Episode five is your <laughs> episode. Um, it is on the Vegan Life Coach podcast. I interview you. I have to tell you that that is still, I think my favorite conversation mm -hmm. of all the podcasts that I've done, it, your story is just incredible. Incredible. I get chills just thinking about it. So if anybody watching has not heard Jeff's full story, um, we dive pretty, pretty deep in, into it mm. in that episode. And I, I think it's definitely worth worth watching. Another funny story, because I would love to work with more men. And I know Stephanie, Stephanie is our head mindset coach. She's actually um, was a, an addictions uh, therapist for a long time. Mm. And she works with uh, within the penitentiaries and helps mm -hmm. with um, people coming out, helps with addiction programs, and, and she works with men. So she's got this uh, kind of badge on her on her chest that says, I can make men cry in the shortest amount of time possible. <laughs> 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 um, so she wears this badge because she, and she loves working with, with men. So yes, we would, we welcome, welcome men. Absolutely. Yes, and, and, and you know, I think the movement, um, uh, when I look at the latest stats and show that 70% um, of those that call themselves plant-based today are women, I see a big gap um, with the, the men not wanting to change out of fear that they will be judged, judged as not being manly or masculine uh, because they don't eat meat. Uh, and it's this judgment, uh, this perpetual judgment that we have on both genders for di in different ways um, that keeps us in a fear state and a fear state keeps us from moving forward in a healthy and happy way. I'm so glad that I, <laughs> I've chosen to live my life freely and openly uh, as a compassionate male, as a vegan male, and, and so happy for what you are doing to get people to be empowered. And look, you know, I think some people see veganism as dogma or plant-based as just this this cult and it's it's not when you are really excited about something that is a positive effect on you the natural thing for any human being is to want to share that with other people i mean when you have a gift to give you share that that's a beautiful thing to do and it's the gift of health and when you have the gift of health and you don't have to suffer through disease states like hypertension and losing kidneys and, and diabetes, heart attack, stroke, I mean, the list just goes on. These are stress diseases, they're dietary diseases, and they're lack of exercise diseases. So this is very easy to take control over, but you have to do the mental and emotional work too as well. Uh, to get there. And that's why I love so much what you're doing with your group. But um, I want to talk about just for uh, a second, hogs and kisses, because this is some of the other work that you're doing. Healing not only uh, 
getting people to move away from eating the animals, but actually healing and helping and loving the animals that are saved from the process to talk about hogs and kisses, which was, uh, I was proud to say our recipient of our donation for 10% of all its sales to clean machine went to hogs and kisses. Yes, and thank you again for that. That was amazing for August. Um, yes, Hogs and Kisses, founded by one of my best friends in the world, Anne uh, Molina. And we have at this point, well, let's see. You know, and this is partly selfish, I will, I will say, because being with those animals is just so good for my soul, you know, mm. that it's, as much you know effort and energy as I put into them, they give me back a hundred times more. Um, so being able to kind of come full circle, I helped Anne go vegan years and years ago, and now she's come back and founded this uh, Hogs and Kisses Farm Sanctuary in North Garden, Virginia, right outside of Charlottesville. And so we're learning as we go, um, and we've got three uh, 700 pounds farm pigs that we are caring for at this point. We rescued them from a, a farm in New York. Um, and we've got uh, five now, five rescue bunnies. And we are fundraising to continue adding uh, more animals. Um, possibly cows are next. Um, but yeah, we're kind of two Miami girls that are doing the country thing, getting out there, learning as we go. Um, and being able to not, and it's really not just, it's not about these few animals that we have on the property. Um, it's about them being ambassadors and we feel pretty confident that they're happy to be ambassadors uh, for, all, for all farmed animals. Um, and really being in a position where people can visit and they can see and they can hear about each individual animal's story and look in their eyes and see that they're no different in their capacity to love and live and fear um, as any other animal, as any dog, as any cat, any animal that we call a pet and we assign them more value um, than we do animals that have been traditionally used as food. I don't see those, those animals are not food, those are individuals. And we've got this society where we are just, um, billions are suffering and dying and I get, I still get choked up thinking about, you know, all the animals that are suffering every second of every day. So it still it gets me. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so totally. I'm right there with you. <laughs> it's 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 why we do what we do and why we've been vegan for so long. Um, to shift gears, not to shift gears too drastically here, but we got a question from uh, from one of our watchers, um, Laura Kaufman. Is your vegan diet different in any way when you train for a competition, and and what do you add? Um, for those of you who are interested in um, doing a competition. In, please know it's a lot of work, it's a lot of discipline, and it's challenging on relationships around you um, because your diet and training is so intensive and so restrictive. Um, it, it, it can be a very big a challenge. So keep that in mind before you make that decision. Talk with other people who have um, have done competitions it can be a joyous thing it can be an amazingly empowering experience and i did it to represent i got on that stage to say you know I, i'm doing this for the animals uh, i'm showing what uh, a 50 year old plus guy can look like on stage and and win <laughs> this is my, my uh, trophies behind me mm -hmm. and win against people who are eating animal products and do it without just to try to get beyond this myth that um you do it but so talk about uh, your dieting and, and stuff and and you actually look like you're competition ready year round so i don't think it's too much work for you but you're not the every person yes no i and i i always tell people i have been lifting weights since i was five years old i've never stopped i was a gymnast i could do more pull-ups in the fifth grade than any boy by far you know so i've been training my my whole life um so i, I do like to put that out there and it's interesting i i did my competition um in 2007 so this was a long time ago uh, but i did it for the same reason as you jeff not because i was really that it, but for me i wasn't that interested in competing but i knew that that's something that i needed to do to get in the limelight and show people what can be done on plant-based um on a plant-based diet so so yes i mean things are, are different and what's interesting is i was just interviewing and this will be out in a few weeks 
um, Danny Taylor and Giacomo from Vegan Proteins. I was before this, I was interviewing them and I asked Danny because they're still very active in the in the competitive world. Um, and I asked her to, to talk to our audience about who should think about what you would tell someone who's thinking about maybe getting into it. And she she said something so wise um, that I want to share. And she said that if you're thinking that being in competition shape is going to make you happy, mm -hmm. then you shouldn't be doing a, a competition because what's going to happen, the repercussions of that, of getting to this state that is absolutely not maintainable for 99% of people and then falling off the other side and going back to how you were before it, it can spin people down the rabbit hole and yep. yeah. so it's really important to go into it already having a healthy relationship with food your body and yourself and when you do that mm -hmm. then 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 you can start thinking about it and really get like you said educated on what that entails and it's these people that we think are are healthy getting up on stage are like, oh, those are the healthiest people I've ever seen. They are the least healthy people. They are dehydrated. <laughs> you know, these are, this is, yeah, if, you, if that makes sense. But yes, um, when you're when you're going into competition, there's a whole science behind it. It's not what I really do anymore. I know a lot of your other um, ambassadors yes. are all about that, Corinne. So I would I would uh, take that question to the people that are actively doing diets for competitions. Yeah, and and definitely there. Uh, obviously, we did the very first uh, vegan, totally hundred percent vegan bodybuilding championship in the world, and Ella was a judge for that. So so proud to work with her on that. Um, but yeah, you can do it uh, completely natural without the use of drugs. Uh, uh, the whole show was nothing but natural athletes, so drug free, tested athletes that we're all 100% vegan for at least one year. So that was really exciting to see 50 people on stage that were all natural and all vegan. Just amazing to see what they accomplished and and sends a powerful message to the rest of the community. They, wait, they can look like that on a plant-based diet. That's inspiring. So if you're going out to inspire other people and, and to do this in a, in a healthy way, there is a way. Like I was eating fruit all the way up to my stage competition um you know most of the other people on the traditional side would like oh my god you can't have fruit that's got sugar it's got carbs it's got fiber you know oh, oh, oh. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, no, I didn't change that much honestly when yeah, i and, did it and i i won my division for for a bikini, yep, yeah. bikini champion so yeah and and so there are ways you can do this in a healthier way for sure danny and giacomo are great coaches corinne is a tremendous three times pro co coach as well and we're celebrating our ambassadors all month this month uh with 25 percent off when you use their code so ella you want to tell people your code and then also how they can get in touch with you for empowerment training for um coaching and any other things yes is my code ella tcm yes <laughs> <laughs> check on that um yeah i knew you had it written written out there um and yes um you can private message me. I'm really accessible. Um, my page, Sexy Fit Vegan, at Sexy Fit Vegan on Instagram, sexyfitvegan.com. Uh, so you're welcome to Facebook message me. Comment below. Um, reach out, Ella, at sexyfitvegan.com. I don't have a, a website specifically for my coaching program, but we do have a Facebook group. That's a support group, Empowered Vegan Life group. Um, and if you're interested in possibly being coached by me, I speak with each and each person individually to see if you are a good fit for the program. So it's, it's all about getting in touch with me. Awesome. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. You're an amazingly beautiful human being inside and out, and um, you're really inspiring and empowering a lot of people and helping animals along the way too. So thank you, Jeff. Thank, thank you, Jeff. You thank so you much. everyone watching too. Stay tuned for next week. We're going to be talking about oxalates and why there may not be such a big problem, why some people don't have a problem at all with oxalates. It's all in the microbiome. I'll be sharing the studies with you on that and how antibiotics can actually cause the issues that most people are experiencing, including kidney stones. I got the research. I'll share it with you. We'll talk to you next week.